Hey everybody, I'm joined here today with Eric Adams. He's the Brooklyn Borough President and um, he has an amazing story to share. Um, he became plant-based uh, a couple years ago. Um, I forget how many years ago. How many years has this been now? Uh, for about four, four years ago now, as I think about it, time moves so fast. And, it does. and, and okay. what's, uh, what's interesting, uh, Richard, is that uh, we want to change it from an amazing story to a regular story because of really the possibilities of health reversal is all around us. And it's, it's unfortunate that when it happens, we think that is something unique when it really should be something that is normal to all of us. Exactly, I so agree with that. So I, I'd like to um, start from the from the, um, the beginning when you were um, uh, diagnosed with diabetes and um, how, how that led you to the plant-based journey. Well, it, it was, uh, as I stated, it was about four years ago and I was out of the country at the time when I was feeling discomfort in my stomach. Uh, I thought sure it was colon cancer because I just lost a friend to colon cancer and the symptoms were so similar to what he described. And it wasn't until I returned to New York that I went to my internist and the doctor told me that he wanted me to have my colon checked and my stomach checked. And when I came from under uh, anesthesia, he shared with me that, Eric, you have an ulcer, but your real crisis is your type two diabetes. He says, you are at the advanced stages. And at the same time, uh, I was losing sight in my eyes. Uh, I actually, that morning when I woke up to go to the doctor, I couldn't even see the alarm clock. The, uh -huh. the whole vision was blurry. And I was having for about two months tingling in my hands and feet. I thought it was just dealing with uh, days of playing sports uh, because my right thigh was just completely numb. And they said that, um, you know, these are all the symptoms of advanced stages of uh, diabetes. He says, I need to put you on, on medicine right away, uh, including insulin. He gave me medicine for my blood pressure, which was extremely high also. My A1C, uh, my cholesterol was high. Uh, the ulcer medicine that I needed, also the vision drops that I needed for my ophthalmologist who said, Eric, you're legally blind. You need to turn in your driver's license. Wow. And it was just a complete change in the normal life that I knew. And he said, this is your new norm. And for a moment, Richard, it was interesting for a moment. I said that, well, Eric, you knew it was coming. Your, you know, your mother's diabetic for 15 years. She was diabetic for 15 years at the time. Uh, you know, your sisters and brothers were going through some version of pre-diabetic or, or diabetic. And I just thought that, you know, this was part of life. It wasn't until he stated that vision loss and the potential of losing uh, fingers and toes would be a part of diabetes that I said, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> you know, right. And that was really a game changer for me on fighting uh, for my life. Right. Well, what was your diet like uh, prior to going plant-based and before you were diagnosed? It was uh, really the traditional male American diet, you know, because men have been brought up in believing uh, the media, the better, real men eat steak. Uh, I was a police officer for 22 years, and let me dispel the rumor of do police officers like donuts? Yes, they do, all kinds. You know, I was, <laughs> I was, I was eating processed food, sugary food, fast food, fried, uh, you know, just a real, you know, fast food. I knew every McDonald's, every KFC, every Burger King. Um, and, you know, really, I used food to deal with the stress of the occupation I was in. I was self-medicating myself when I had a stressful day uh, in policing. I would go grab that Philly steak and that nice big uh, donut or apple pie. You know, every meal had to be a wash down with a soda that was filled with sugar and some type of cake or pastry. That was the reality of my life, you know, a traditional American diet. 
Yeah, I've been there myself. <laughs> the only difference was I, I would have diet soda thinking that I'd be saving calories. But that was ridiculous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I wanted to go um, uh, after your diagnosis. Um, how long did it take you to um, find out about plant based eating? You did research right away, or? And it was so fascinating that when uh, the doctors told me that, you know, what was my plight, I said, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I am a ex, I'm a cop, ex cop. I know how to do investigations. And darn it, I know how to read. <laughs> so I went to five of the best doctors here in New York. They all told me the same thing that Eric is in your DNA. Uh, this is what you're going to have to do. And I remember the day Richard sent down at my laptop and having a bottle of medicine, all the medicines that they gave me and the pamphlets. And the pamphlets said, living with diabetes, how to live with diabetes. And I typed something different. I typed reversing diabetes into my Google search. And all of this information came up, including uh, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Greger, Dr. Barnard, and other great physicians who have started to explore lifestyle medicine. And I started to read and I was blown away. And I called Dr. Esselstein and stated that I would like to you know, come and see him. And he said, come down. And I, I flew to the Cleveland Clinic and he gave me just useful information. I tried some of the food that he had there and it just started me on a new pathway. And overnight, uh, when, I became, when I returned to the city and I looked at my fridge in my cupboard, uh, the pantry, I saw that all the food he was talking about, processed, mm -hmm. filled, with, filled yeah. with salt, oil, uh, fatty, and I just discarded all of that food. And three weeks after going to a whole food plant-based diet, my vision came back. Three months later, my nerve damage went away. Uh, my diabetes went in remission. And that ulcer that sent me to the doctors in the first place also went away. No medicine, only food. And it was an amazing recovery uh, that I just really want to encourage people to know that there's a possibility of being healthy. And that's what the book is about, Healthy at Last, uh, how to use plant-based to really turn around your health condition. Definitely. Now, I bet those five doctors you, you said you saw in New York, I bet none of them mentioned a plant-based diet at the time. Not at all, not at all. Uh, they all uh, told me they were experts on the drugs I needed to take to cover up my uh, symptoms. And it's, I think, one of the greatest betrayals uh, we have in our country, if not the globe, is that all of those young men and women as children that wanted to be physicians to heal people went into institutions of medical training. And instead of telling people how to heal, they showed them how to write prescriptions and to cover symptoms. And it's really a betrayal to the healthcare profession. And our goal is really to empower doctors to know how do you heal people? How do you uh, give them the things they need to change their lifestyles so that they can start to recover from the health crises that our country is facing? When you think about it, we're spending 80 cents on a dollar on chronic diseases. 30 million Americans are diabetic, 84 million are pre-diabetic. This is not sustainable. The amount of productivity that we're losing inside our jobs and work environment, uh, people are taking off. Our children, 70% of 12 year olds have early signs of heart disease. The increase in level of obesity, uh, childhood diabetes. When you look at how our behaviors are creating a crisis, that is going to bankrupt this country if we don't get it under control. Now is the time to really start turning around. And that's what the book is about, showing how you can take real incremental steps uh, to have a healthy lifestyle. Definitely. 
And I, I like the steps you took in New York. I believe um, you're, you're trying to get more plant-based meals in, into schools. And I wanted to ask you how that's going. Uh, it's going very you. well. You know, I'm a big believer, Richard, that, of you know, we can't tell New Yorkers or Americans uh, what to put on their grills in their backyards or what to put on their kitchen table. But government should not feed the crises. So wherever we oh, agree. feed New Yorkers, whatever we feed Americans on taxpayers' dollars, it should be healthy that we're not causing healthcare crises. And so we're focusing on our schools right now. Uh, we're doing something called Meatless Mondays so we can show children how to eat healthy meals without having something as toxic as some of the meat products, the hamburgers, the chicken McNuggets, uh, the pizza, the cheese consumption. And it has turned to be extremely informative and the children have embraced it. We're also uh, looking at how do we change the foods that we feed in the child protective custodies, our correctional facilities, our hospitals. We have meatless Mondays in our hospitals. And we have been extremely successful in having the city of New York stop purchasing processed meat, which is a type one carcinogen. I was so happy that was, that. Yeah. that was a major victory for us. And we want to continue down that path to show uh, right now we're moving to do a 50% beef reduction in the city purchasing procurement. And we want to see that turn into 100% no beef uh, purchasing in the city. And so we're moving forward with some extreme, innovative, intelligent ways of fighting chronic diseases on the front end and not the back end. I think it's a model for the nation. Yes. I'm really hoping other um, places, uh, you know, Pick up where you left off. And, and we believe um, so. How, how do you deal with the um, resistance? Have you gotten much resistance from um, you know, some of the meat eaters out there that I'm sure are not too happy about it, but they have to wake up anyway with some of these health conditions. But how do you deal with that? And of course, there's resistance because change is difficult, particularly when it becomes cultural change. Let's, keep, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, number one, uh, there's a reason they use the term comfort food because many of us are self-medicating ourselves with the food that we eat to deal with other trauma that we are experiencing in our lives. But also uh, what we eat is attached to our culture. Uh, when I ate that chocolate donut or that chocolate cake, it was something that my dad gave me when I had a bad day in Little League. Or you know, there were foods that were attached to my favorite aunt or recipes that was handed down uh, inside. They were handed down generation after generation. And so when you start to talk about those foods and those meals, people see it as you are attacking their culture, you are attacking uh, things that they attach those foods to. So we're not trying to be mean, we're not trying to talk down to people or food shame people. We want to give people information so they can make intelligent decisions and then show how you can get what you're looking for in food. You can take some of those uh, meals that are culturally norm and just change how you produce them. Sure. Uh, you can make a burrito uh, made out of beans and tofu and using whole wheat flour instead of white processed flour. Uh, you can make macaroni and cheese using a uh, lentil macaronis or black bean macaroni and nutritional yeast to get the cheese flavor that you're looking for. Uh, sweet potatoes are healthy food, but you right. don't have to pound on all the sugar when you, when you cook it. So we can take those traditional meals, modify them to be healthy meals, because I'm a strong believer, food must look good, it must be good, but darn it, it needs to taste good. There's a I reason totally our agree. palates enjoy different tastes so that we can enjoy food and you can get all those things and do it in a healthy way. I'm glad you said that because um, I imagine you wouldn't have stuck with this if it didn't taste good. <laughs> so true. The yeah. first week, you know, it's almost laughable when I think about uh, my first week <laughs> of doing whole food plant-based. 
And the first week I said, oh my God, if I have to eat this, I'm not going to make it. Uh, I used to make a cereal in the morning made out of uh, just flax seeds that I didn't even grind up. <laughs> so, uh, but eventually, when you have, when you make a lifestyle change, you need to immerse yourself into it. So I started to read and I started to do recipes, one new recipe a week. Every Sunday was my experimental days. Eventually I was able to come up with seven recipes. Then it was able to get 14, 20, 30 recipes. I started creating a repertoire of recipes that included my fast recipes that I had to do on the go, recipes I could take time to make. And then I did something else. I started to explore the power of spices. Prior to my whole food journey, I would only have salt and pepper for the most part. Yeah, but I started too. to look at spices and find out their health values. And I was really surprised, surprised to know the spices and the power of turmeric, the powers of cumin uh, and uh, cinnamon and other spices nutmeg and how they play a crucial role, ginger and garlic, uh, on how they play a crucial role on your overall health. And I started adding them to my meals. And now I must say I'd make great meals and I cook good and I, I'm enjoying what I am eating. Oh, me, me as well. What's your favorite spice? Just curious. Uh, uh, my, probably my favorite spice is nutritional yeast and turmeric and cumin. I enjoy those tastes a lot. And I, and I also love uh, uh, garlic, uh, yeah. mixing garlic into my food. It's not only healthy, but it gives it a great taste um, when you're looking for a nice you know, flavor to really help your meals with. Definitely, definitely. And let's talk about how you, um, you helped your mom um, reverse diabetes. Because um, my mom as well, she, um, you know, she went plant-based uh, pretty much after after I did. And I'd like to um, hear about um, how she's doing and hopefully she's stuck with it as well. Yes, and you know, my mother grew up on a Southern diet and she was 80 years old when she went plant-based. She was diabetic for 15 years, seven years on insulin. And after two months of doing plant-based, mother was able to get off her insulin. And she struggled with the plant-based lifestyle, you know, from time to time uh, because Remember, it is really hard to uh, really find your stride. And she found it, and now she's doing well. She Every once in a while, she would slip back. Uh, but perfection is not the goal. The goal is to do the best you can, find your comfort place, and understand the power of what you eat and how it impacts on your health. That is what I want all your listeners to know. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, exactly. There may be days that you will slip back and you'll eat something that you know you're not supposed to. It's fine. Uh, your body will continue to adjust. Don't you know? be down on yourself. As I told mom all the time, really understand that you have the power in you uh, to deal with the health crises that you're dealing with. And I think that is so important. And that's what I share with all of my family. All of them were going through some form of chronic disease um, from breast cancer to kidney loss uh, to other form of cancers. And now they're all taking a close look at the food that they're eating to have a lifestyle change. Definitely, definitely. And um, have your brothers and sisters, they, they've, um, have they gotten on board with the plant-based eating as well? Yes, they have. Uh, they have really looked at my life, looked at the life of mom, looked at their own uh, health crisis, and they're starting to really understand that you don't have to follow the cycle of believing uh, that these chronic diseases are, your, are in your DNA. They're learning that it's not the DNA, it's your dinner. And we, we don't share, it's not that we share the same lineage, we share the same lunch, and that is why we're dealing with the many of our crises and they have started to embrace how do we eat differently? And I'm really proud of them um, as they are really learning how to turn around the healthcare crises that they were facing. You know, and I know it's traumatic going in and told, being told you have cancer, 
being told uh, you have to have surgery, um, if you're gonna lose your kidney, and some of the other chronic diseases that our loved ones are facing all the time. Mm-hmm. It is like being thrown a life raft when you are in a sea of uncertainty and knowing that there's a possibility you can be saved. And that is my goal, not only for my family, but the extended family of Brooklynites, of New Yorkers, and of Americans, and if not only here in our country, but across the globe, I want people to heal and live a productive life with their family. And it's, Richard, it's not about only living forever. We know mortality. Yeah, not the quality of, of life. Exactly. Yeah. Mortality is part of what our existence is, but it's about being able to reach 100 and you can still identify your grandchildren because Alzheimer's dementia has not settled in. It's yeah. about not having to go to dialysis three days a week, three hours a day, or having to lose your limb because diabetes is the number one cause of non-trauma limb amputation, or losing your sight because diabetes is the number one cause of blindness, or heart disease where you're constantly going in for stent or heart surgery. That is what it's about. How do we live a quality life while we are alive and not just exist and we're propped up on medicine That is what my desire is, to have a qualitative life while we're here. And that's what led you to write the book, which which I'd like to learn more about now. If you could tell me a bit, um, you know, why why you started writing it and um, just hope to reach with it. The the, the book is called Healthy at Last, and it is really showing a plant-based lifestyle to deal with and reversing uh, chronic diseases. Uh, And really, it shows us the journey. It shows us the origin of food. It shows us the steps we can take uh, to reverse uh, chronic diseases. It shows us some of the small items we can do in our lives. And it talks about my story, my family story, and the origin of food, and how we can really change our environment. And it is really an easy read. I looked at it as if I was trying to make this journey. What can I do and how do I change uh, what I was doing every day? And I'm really proud of the book because all the proceeds of the book is going to go uh, to building out uh, health ministries and all of our faith-based institutions. I think that we need to go to where people attend uh, to find uh, their faith in their belief system Uh, to encourage them to live a more healthy lifestyle. So this is really exciting for me. I'm encouraged about about the book is going to be released in October, but you can pre-order on Amazon or any of these other sites. We're going to have an audible copy as well. And so I am really looking forward to people taking the book, giving it away for Christmas gifts, Kwanzaa gifts, Hanukkah gifts, and just getting our children to start learning about a more healthy lifestyle so we don't continue a generation of chronic diseases. We continue a generation of healthy living. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, Congratulations on it. I think it's uh, it's gonna be an awesome book. I really look forward to it. Thank you. And, um, you know, I plan to give it as a gift as well. There's a number of people in my family who I know could definitely (laughs) benefit from it, so. Thank you. do you have, um, so I know you included recipes in there. Do you have um, a certain favorite you'd like to share with us? Uh, we, we have a great uh, few good recipes that are in the book. One of my favorite is the uh, Chipotle uh, mac and cheese. I, I just love it. You know, you think sometimes the macaroni and cheese that, you know, milk and dairy is, um, is bad for you, but you know, you can have a great uh, cheesy taste that you look for with macaroni made out of beans or pasta. And I challenge people to tell me the difference between a macaroni that's made out of just water and beans or water water and lentils, and then those that's made out of white processed flour, you won't be able to tell the difference. Exactly. Another favorite is my roasted veggie lasagna. Oh, I just love it. It's a great meal to, to have. And when you look through the book, uh, you will see that there's so many great meals, meals. And I have some great uh, health celebrities that they have, you know, come together and assisted in 
giving recipes in a book. Uh, a great, another great meal is my sweet potatoes enchiladas with cashew uh, chili sour cream. All plant-based, all healthy, all amazing meals, and you could enjoy each one of them. And, but there's so many other meals that are in the book that I really encourage people to you know, just dig in and just mm -hmm. try your hand. I was not a cook before. And I just started experimenting a little at a time. And I was able to create some great dishes uh, that now I use. And I use many of the recipes that's, that's in the book. Nice, nice. I also would like to um, shift gears a little and talk about COVID-19, because this was on everybody's mind these days. Um, I think New York has done an amazing job along with uh, the state I live in, Connecticut. You know, we've kind of uh, worked together to get it under control. Um, what, what have you learned about the virus? Um, I mean, what have you learned from this experience? And it's really something to think about. And I'm glad you raised that because when you look at over 90% of the people who died in New York City or 90% of the people who were hospitalized, uh, it was due to pre-existing conditions. So 90% of the people who, who had to be hospitalized had pre-existing conditions. Over 90% of the people who died had pre-existing conditions and had comorbidities. Those are fancy terms for, for diabetes, heart disease, respiratory, asthma. Uh, all of those diseases uh, are preventable in many cases, but reversible as well. I believe uh, we missed a golden opportunity where we should have focused on building and strengthening the immune system of people who had comorbidities. Our cities uh, across America and particularly here in New York, we were feeding people in emergency food allocations during this crisis. We should have focused on feeding them healthy food. This could have played the role of introducing people to a healthier lifestyle and it would have been food that strengthened their immune system. I think we could have had an even better impact on how we could have uh, helped those New Yorkers, the thousands of New Yorkers who died from COVID-19 across the country and in New York uh, City. Even in our uh, nursing homes, we lost a great deal of seniors in nursing homes. We should have put in uh, new feeding procedures to give people healthy food, to strengthen the immune Definitely. system. We failed to do so. And many of my medical experts are stating that in uh, October, November, uh, COVID-19 may return with a vengeance. And so we need to use this as an opportunity as we feed the millions of uh, meals that we fed people uh, and citizens. We need to make sure that those are healthy meals and, that, and not meals that are going to actually feed the crisis. Yeah, and I've seen some of the meals like in nursing homes, and it's just absolutely terrible. I don't know how they get away with it. And, and a lot of these people don't have a choice, and they have to eat these, these foods. But yeah, I, I, I hope I, that. I visited people that were in, uh, you know, they had to go to hospitals or family members that were sick. And they said, Eric, when we got to the hospital, they were feeding us the food that was aggravating my diabetes. So they was exposing me even more. And that is just really unfortunate and problematic uh, right. that we are doing this instead of giving people a more healthier lifestyle and a healthier outcome. Right, right. Is there a way to um, get the message out, you think, um, for, for the hospitals and nursing homes? I'm sure you're doing the best you can. But we're doing an amazing partnership with some of the safety net hospitals, the hospital that treat poor people in the city. Uh, we've uh, partnered uh, with uh, physicians over at Downstate Hospital. Uh, our uh, head of the hospital there, Dr. Rowley, has been really a leader in how they're going to look at during the instructions and teachers of their doctors, they want to introduce a more plant-based lifestyle into their curriculum. Um, we are pushing legislation on the state level uh, to encourage a more, uh, or encourage more instruction around nutrition in our medical schools here. And so there's great opportunity uh, to uh, move this conversation forward 
to make sure we start preparing our doctors to understand the power of nutrition, the power of, of health, of yes. being preactive and uh, proactive instead of just reactive with prescriptions. Yeah, that is so needed. I, I'm very, very happy to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I probably should wrap this up soon, but I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, but um, when, when is the uh, when does the book come out? Uh, the book is going. You can pre-order it now, but it's going to be released in October. And again, uh, this is uh, just healthy at last, a plant-based approach to reversing. Uh, and, and, and dealing with chronic diseases in our country. Uh, you know, the goal is prevention and reversal. And it will be available. Uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon now, uh, but it will be available in October. And we look forward to getting this into households, getting it into schools, uh, getting it into uh, our faith-based institutions, and just starting to empower people on how to live healthy and be healthy at last. That's so important. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.